Okay, our last presentation for the day is on interactions, community interactions. When we talk about ecology, this is really community ecology, right? This is the ecology between organisms. So organisms, all different species, all living in the same area is known as a community or different populations living in the same area is known as a community. Um, and we focus on the interactions within those communities, right? And there are four main ways. There's actually more than four, but we just, we're going to have you focus on four main um uh, main ways that organisms or individuals affect each other. One's competition, right? Yeah. If you have wolves and let's say wolves and coyote. lynx, eh, sometimes wolves and coyotes could cross over, right? They might try to compete for the same food, right? So there's competition there. Um, or different types of birds competing for a certain nesting area. Um, or, yeah, it's competing for food and, and so forth. We have predator-prey relationships, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we have symbiotic relationships. Symbiosis means like you're working kind of closely with something. So very symbiotic, good. right? So so very we're closely together. Yeah. And then the last one is, is coevolution, which we'll talk about that last. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's go through these first. Um, competition is pretty easy. So you can kind of see competition here, right? Competition between within a species, right, which would be intraspecific or interspecific um, competition. Okay, um, so we'll get back to competition. Actually, let's go there. Let's start right there first. So just to make sure we're good with competition, competition can be either um, competition within a species, so birds of the same species competing for mates or competing for food, or competition between different species, so different types of birds competing with each other. So I feel like competition is pretty easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, symbiotic relationships. So symbiosis is just a relationship in which two different organisms live in close association with each other. One example, one type of symbiotic relationship is this type known as mutualism. You ever heard of mutualism? No. no. Okay. So mutualism is a type of symbiotic relationship where both organisms benefit from that relationship. Okay. Right? So they both are helped by it. Um, good examples of this would be this guy right here. Who's that? Nemo. That's Nemo. Do you know what type of fish Nemo is? Clownfish. Clownfish. Very good. And what does he? What does a clownfish live in? Coral. Uh, not coral. A sea. Uh, no. I say an anemone. I can't say it either. An anemone. An anemone. <laughs> right. So the sea anemone is a is a living creature, right? And obviously Nemo. So the clownfish is a living creature. Stings and right, this is actually a, a it can sting organisms, but the clownfish is immune to that sting to that poison. So the clownfish gets protection from other predators around there. And the clownfish brings food in, and some of the scraps go to the sea anemones. So they kind of help each other. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another example would be bees and flowers, right? So this isn't a bee, but this butterfly. kind of the same thing. That's a butterfly. What do butterflies and bees do for flowers? Uh, what do they help spread? Seeds. Ooh, what makes you what makes you have allergies? Pollen. Pollen, right? So they're pollinators. So the bees get nectar. The the other insects like butterflies get nectar from flowers. It's their food source. And in return, they get covered in pollen and they spread that pollen around to help kind of um, spread pollen around to increase variation, right? Variation is a big thing. Um, you can see a symbiotic relationship here. Again, pollinators with a hummingbird and feeding from a flower. Uh, another one would be a shark and remora. Sometimes these can go either way. Shark remora could be this one or the next one, which Going I'll explain. More. So a shark, obviously you know the shark is. Yeah. Remora are the small fish that have like the suckers that can suck up onto oh, the bottom of the yeah, shark. Oh, yeah, because the remora like has like a rod. Yeah, it gets a rod. Yeah, good. And the and they actually – um Yeah, and you know, wild crats, exactly. Um, and the remora can clean parasite and things off the shark, okay. so they kind of help each other. Okay, so that's mutualism. Both are helped. And birds like help the hippo get clean. Mm-hmm. Um, Commensalism, right? So commensalism is, oh, just to highlight, mutualism is a plus plus. So both are helped. Commensalism is a plus zero. And that zero doesn't mean negative. It means nothing. So in a commensalistic relationship, one organism benefits and the other one doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Right? So do you know, do you know what a barnacle is? Yes. The barnacles you see them on rocks at the ocean? Yeah. Do you know they grow on, do you know they grow on whales? They do. <laughs> they do? Yeah, look at it. See whales? Look at it. This whale has barnacles all over its tail, all over its belly. Do you think a whale really cares if it has barnacles on it? No. No, it doesn't care at all, right? So the barnacles are helped because they're filter feeders. They need water, movement. They need food to kind of filter through for them to survive. 
So they get a free ride with the whale, and the whale could care less. It doesn't harm the whale at because all. Because they yeah. usually stick on rocks when it's low tide. They don't have any. Right. Yeah. Usually, but sometimes if they get if you're living on a whale, like that's a that means that that uh, that barnacle to... struck it big. And it's like winning a lottery for a barnacle. You're not living on the rocks. You're living on the whale, seeing the world, which is awesome. Uh, another symbiotic relationship would be birds and trees. Like trees typically don't care if birds live in there. They don't really do much for them, but the birds obviously benefit from that. Okay. Yeah. The last one, and this is the one I don't like, is a, is a parasitism. You know what a parasite is? No. Your brother's a parasite. No, I'm just he kidding. Bites. He's not a parasite. Um, so symbiosis, parasitism is one organism benefits, the parasite benefits, while the other one is, is harms. So with this, like fleas are bad. Like we put flea medication on Woody every once in a while to make sure he doesn't get fleas. Woody's our dog, right? But fleas are bad. Mosquitoes can be parasites as well. Um, so with that, uh, tapeworms, right? Tapeworms are, are definitely parasites as well. Um, and the oxpecker and African buffalo, I actually kind of going to argue that that's not the best example for this. Yeah. Because oftentimes what happens is, oh, this one here is a little bit different. So you'll see different ones. So this one actually does, does actually a parasite in terms of the, the buffalo. But you also see some birds that, that actually eat parasites off of ox. Yeah, that's what I and they help in a way. But this one actually, I think, picks at the buffalo to kind of get, you know, blood and guts from the buffalo. So it doesn't kill the buffalo, but it's not good. But you also see some some types of birds actually feed off parasites as well. So it's slightly different That's than this like one. Rhinos too. Yeah, rhinos as well. Um, so so symbiosis parasitism is where one is benefits, the parasite benefits, and the the host, right, obviously is harmed. Usually not killed, mm -hmm. but harmed. The worst one here are leeches and tapeworms. Blah. You know what a leech is? Yeah. Leeches can kind of get stuck to your, your hand and they start sucking your blood. Yeah. And then tapeworms are something that get in your stomach and they grow in your stomach. Blech. You know, that's why you got to cook your meat. <laughs> All right. Predator prey relationship. Pretty easy. Predators are organisms that hunt, prey organisms that are killed and eaten. So here we have our, this looks like a, it looks like a peregrine falcon to me right there. Um, this right here, we have a, an antelope and a cheetah. That looks like a cheetah to me. Mm -hmm. um, this looks like a lynx and a hare. Little little rabbit. It's kind of blocked a little bit. Let's move our screen, and you might be able to see it. There you oh, go. Okay. Yeah. So there's a little rabbit or a hare. Um, so predator prey. Obviously, this is some type of symbiotic relationship. With this one, it's a plus for the predator and dead for the prey. So it's not good for the prey. Um, but the interesting way to look at predator prey relationships is we can look at um, we can look at this. So the links are. We can fast. look at at population changes, population curves between the predator and the prey, and that's what you see here. So here's our graph. The snowshoe hare, right, is in blue, mm -hmm. and the lynx is in. I'm gonna move this up a little bit. Red. The lynx is in red. red. red okay. Red, red, red. So yeah. notice though, this is kind of a crazy graph because if you think about how ecosystems work, right, the prey population needs to be a lot bigger than the predator population just kind of going up our our food chains right if you think of like where what's most out there there are more plants out there than there are herbivores right insects things like that and there are more insects and small herbivores than there are you know secondary consumers such as frogs or things like that and if you get all the way to the top to the food chain there are far less apex predators out there like lynx or hawks than there are of all the other organisms. So because of that, if you'll notice this graph, it's on the same x-axis, but the y-axis is split. On the left, you have a y-axis, which is in the thousands because that's for the rabbits because there's a lot more hares out there or rabbits, right? And here you can see the, the axis is a little bit different for the lynx. But the problem is if we tried to graph the lynx on this number graph and this axis, you wouldn't be able to see it. It almost looked like a flat line. Mm -hmm. so, so you need to split the axes a little bit to kind of see the relationship. So let's take a look here. Um, let's see. We see the red line coming down. So our lynx population is really low right here. And when there aren't that many lynx around, what happens to the rabbit population? They get more. They go up, right? Because there's a lot more rabbits. There's no predators eating them. So when the rabbit population goes up, what happens to the lynx population? They go down. No. They it, go up. It's going to go up because the more rabbits are in the environment, there's more food for the predators. More food for the predators, right? If there's more rabbits, can there be more lynx to eat? To eat the rabbits? Yeah. Right. So the lynx population goes up. But when the lynx population goes up, what happens to the rabbit population now? 
it goes down, right? Because there's so many links eating it. And then when the rabbit population goes down, what happens to the link population? There's not enough food, so a lot of them die off, right? And you can see this relationship, which is a predator-prey relationship, that is cyclical. They'll go up and down. As predator population goes up, I'm sorry, as prey population goes up, you can see more, more predators in the environment. So the predator population goes up. And then as the predator population goes up, more prey are killed. Okay. And that's our presentation for the day. What Thanks for watching. Thousands on the uh, no, those are years. So this is looking from 1850 to 1925. Those and um, years. the snow hair yeah. can like hide, but the lynx, it's faster. It's faster. And it tries to hide, right? Yeah, so because that's... the snow is white. In the... Exactly. But the, the lynx can also smell really well, too. Mm -hmm. You can find them. Yeah. All right. They Thanks can... for watching, everybody. See you later. Say bye. Bye. bye.